Food Industry COVID-19 Virtual Office Hours. Uh, so my name is Alyosha Teremcic, also known as Al. I am a Dairy Extension Associate at Cornell University. And one of my responsibilities during this pandemic was to keep our COVID-19 webpage up to date, which is something I did together with my colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Demings. As you probably noticed, I'm taking Dr. Alkane's role of hosting this session of Office Hours today. Uh, and Dr. Demings will take my role of introducing what is new on our webpage, uh, which is something she's gonna do on top of everything else she is and has been doing behind the scenes uh, during our office hours. So um, the, current, the current hot topic besides can we make vaccination mandatory is that the Delta variant of the virus is on the rise. Uh, it looks like um, it's not a question of if, but when this variant will become dominant uh, variant in the US. Uh, the same way as there are large differences in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths across different states, there are, there's also a large difference in uh, representation of different variants across different states. Uh, the good news is that vaccination is very much effective regardless of variants um, that are circling around. Uh, and yes, that means that vaccines are also effective against Delta variant. Um, we are getting some information that uh, vaccinated people are getting COVID-19 but this is something that was to be expected when we say vaccines are 95% effective. It means that 95 people are saved for every five that get infected. And all, and all five that do get infected most likely go through a much milder disease than they would without vaccination. And this is true for all variants, including Delta. Um, so I have to say this again, we should get vaccinated. Uh, currently, there are still large differences in percentage of uh, vaccinated people in different states. Um, I'm going to mention Vermont, 75% of adults fully vaccinated. Uh, and this is an example where we could be. But nationally, these numbers will be hard to reach very soon if we continue vaccinating at the current diminishing rate. Uh, we mentioned Vermont here in New York. We are also part of success story. Uh, the decrease in infection rate and increase in percentage of vaccinated people uh, has led to Governor Cuomo announce, announcing the end of the uh, state disaster and emergency uh, this Friday, so June 25th. Um, now, naturally, all these changes um, and new information coming from US and globally uh, leaves food industry and general public with, with all sorts of questions. So to answer these questions, Today, again, we have a really nice uh, panel of experts that, are, that responded to our call. Um, so besides representatives from both food safety and dairy division of New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, uh, we have Dr. Elizabeth Finn, Senior Extension Associate at Cornell University and Director of Produce Safety Alliance. Uh, we already mentioned Dr. Elizabeth Demings, Extension Specialist and Program Coordinator, coordinator of, at Cornell's Institute for Food Safety. Uh, we also have Dr. Camille Neal, Professor of Animal and Food Science at University of Delaware. Uh, we have Dr. Martin Weedman, Gellert Family Professor of Food Safety at Cornell University and Co-Director of New York State Integrated Food Safety Center of Excellence. Uh, we have our first law expert and special guest, Melanie Newman. Uh, she is the executive uh, vice president and general counsel at Matrix Sciences International. And we have our second law expert and special guest that will give us a short presentation, Dr. David, David Sherwin. Dr. Sherwin uh, is the John and Melissa uh, Shirelli Professor of Hospitality Human Resources and Professor of Law at Cornell University. He is the academic director of Cornell Center for Innovation, Hospitality, Label, Labor, and Employment uh, Relations, and a research fellow at Center for Labor and Employment Law at NYU School of Law. Dr. Sherwin also has a lot of experience practicing labor and employment law, as well as counseling law firm on these and related issues, which I'm sure is, uh, comes very handy when you have to apply law uh, to new real life situations like pandemic that, uh, that's caused by new type of virus uh, that's handicapping uh, the entire globe. Now, before I go uh, give my word uh, to Dr. Sherwin, I would ask Dr. Demings to give us a brief update on what's new on our COVID-19. Well, hi, um, I'm Elizabeth Demings and I just posted the link to the uh, website um, for the Institute uh, for um, Food Safety at Cornell. 
um, at Cornell. And so I'll just briefly go through um, the website. And Al, can you see the web page? Yes. OK, great. Um, so uh, in early June, we did post um, some updates to our food industry FAQs. Um, so if you look under the persistence of COVID-19, we also have um, under the sections for vaccinations, your employee policies, as well as the facility procedures. So I'd encourage you to go ahead and take a look at some of those. Um, we also have um, an update to our templates and trainings page. So we, um, in June, published our um, training for um, employees who work on fresh produce farms and also in packing houses. These trainings are available in both English and Spanish. Uh, the training videos are short. Um, the English version is just over 15 minutes and the Spanish version is about 20 minutes. Um, they can both be viewed on YouTube. Um, there's also um, an option for you to get a certificate for the training. So employees could take a three question quiz and then they'll receive an email confirmation that they actually completed this training. Um, if we move on under the food industry resources, looking at the management training, um, we have completed um, this free course that's available to take on demand. So um, as I'll mentioned, even as we continue to vaccinate more and more of our workforce, there are going to be some facilities where you might have a mix of vaccinated and unvaccinated employees, um, or your facility might be located in one of the regions of this country or internationally where you have really low vaccination rates. So this um, COVID-19 uh, management training um, um, my, is a great course um, to take. It's really targeted towards your managers and supervisors, um, and it has all of the tools and resources that they need to help manage the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, on the website, you can see um, each module, you can link directly to it, and there's um, a short description about what's covered in each of those modules. Then if we move under to the um, international resources pages, um, uh, we do have some updates um, on some translated resources, um, including some of our infographics, um, such as how to handle fresh produce. And also we've translated um, frequently asked questions into several different languages. Um, so if you're interested in, in some of those resources, check out our international resources page. Um, and then um, under the podcasts and webinars, just as a reminder, um, you can find um, listings for any upcoming events. Um, our coronavirus boosters, we're moving those to a monthly schedule now. So our next booster is going to be posted in mid-July. And then the final section I just want to remind you of is our virtual office hours section. And of course, this is where we post all of our information about upcoming sessions of our food industry virtual office hours. And Al, that's all I have for a website update. So I'll send it back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good overview. Um, so as we mentioned, um, getting as, as many people vaccinated, so people that can be vaccinated, getting them vaccinated as soon as possible is really crucial to stopping this pandemic. Uh, but with this, we stumble on a question, can vaccination be made mandatory for uh, employees? Um, and what are the con uh, considerations that employer uh, has to make uh, in order to do this uh, uh, and make vaccination a requirement. So to start us off, we asked Dr. Sherwin to give us a short presentation on this topic. And then after that, we will open it up for questions. So Dr. Uh, Sherwin, if you can. Yes, thank you. thanks, Al. And um, um, I, uh, as a lawyer, as a JD, I guess technically I'm a doctor, but um, I'm not like a real PhD like you all. So Dave is fine. <laughs> You know, doctor, it's not really there for me. Um, my short answer, can you require your employees to get a vaccine is yes, you can. Um, that the law right now, um, there's nothing that truly prohibits it unless you're in a state or a municipality that has issued a statute saying that you can't require the vaccine. Um, I know this was discussed in Florida and some other states. I don't know if it's actually been passed. And I would argue that even if those laws are passed, that they may not withstand scrutiny, judicial scrutiny, because I don't think that um, the government has the right to, 
to require that given what the risks are for the employer, the coworkers, the, the customers, guests, and so on. Um, the problem is if there's a statute in your state or in your local municipality, and you wanna argue that it's, um, that it's unconstitutional in some way, you're looking at years of litigation and employers are not gonna do that. So if there's a statute locally, you're gonna comply with it. But what if there isn't? As in New York, there is no statute. So can employers require the vaccine? Again, short answer, yes, because in the United States, employers have a lot of rights to define their employer-employee relationship. Just like employers can tell you to wear a uniform, tell you to be somewhere at nine o'clock you know, in the morning, tell you that this is the health insurance they'll provide, we can say, I want everyone to get a vaccine. What are the limitations on the employer's ability to exercise that authority? And the answer is that the limitations are statutes. There are either con there's, there's some common law developed by the courts, but generally it's statutes and what would affect COVID um, vaccinations, as I see it, would be two things. There would be the laws that prohibit discrimination based on religion or disability. Those are the two areas that you could see people argue, I don't want to get the vaccine because of my religion. I can't get the vaccine because of my disability. Now, the EOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, initially, when this, when the vaccine became more you know, became out there and became a thing, you know, not December, but by February, March, had put out a, um, a announcement, sort of a overview of the law. And they had said that when it comes to religion, if the employee has a sincere belief that this vaccine would violate their religion, they are protected. That is correct except they missed the second part of the description or the discussion, and that's why the EOC had to walk it back. Yes, you're protected, but now the question is, what does that protection mean, and do I have to accommodate it? And under discrimination law, we have to accommodate religion, and we have to accommodate disability. We use the exact same words, but operationalizing it is very, very different. So I'm going to geek out for a minute to explain the differences between religious accommodation and disability accommodation, because it, it's extraordinarily, rele extraordinarily relevant to this discussion. Um, religious, the religious protection is part of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So it's been around a really long time. And the, one, and the lead case, the case that defines what is a religious accommodation comes out of the 70s, it's, it's Partisan v. TWA. Partisan worked, I think he's a baggage handler at TWA, at the time, one of the two or three largest airlines in the world. He was a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, their Sabbath is Friday night through Saturday night. He didn't wanna work on Saturdays because that was prohibited by his religion. Um, in his job, he would have had to work because of seniority and it was unionized and he couldn't uh, bump the union seniority. He would have to work some number of Saturdays during the year, around 10 or so when people were on vacation, other things, that's what he was going to have to work. Um, and he said, I can't work those Saturdays. So what I, I, here are my options or your options. You can pay somebody else to work those Saturdays. Of course, since those people would now be working overtime, in addition to the time, you would have had to pay partisan anyway. Now you have to pay plus a half, so time and a half. So there was half, half salary for those 10 or so days. The other things that he said um, was that, um, that he could um, have fewer people working on those Saturdays, just have less people. And again, that was another option. Um, the other thing was that a supervisor could do the work and it made it all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court held that anything that has more than a de minimis effect on the business does not have to be done by the employer to accommodate religion. That is still the law. 
If it has more than a de minimis effect, you don't have to do it. At the time, the financial hardship for TWA was in the neighborhood of $150. That's what it would have cost extra. And that would have been maybe a third of an, air, of an airline ticket from New York to California at the time. And the Supreme Court held that was too much, that the employer didn't have to do that. So when you look at from a vaccine standpoint, and I say, all right, if I have people who are unvaccinated at my workplace, I have to have them wearing masks. I have to have social distancing. Now I have customers and guests who come in and they are reluctant to come in because they're afraid of getting the virus, which, you know, for whatever reason, they don't have the vaccine, they're, they're immunocompromised, so on, that this could cause major problems for them. All of those things, to me, are more than a de minimis effect on the business having to manage non-vaccinated people and all the rules and regs that go with it is a lot more than having to spend 150 bucks. So I think that the religious accommodation is something that I am not concerned with as the law now. However, the Supreme Court, this Supreme Court has been very pro-religion. And we saw that when they refused, when they refused to allow states to limit religious services. So it is possible that somebody could take this case to the Supreme Court and overturn it. But if that's the case, I, I you know, that's a plaintiff's lawyer is going to have to invest three to five years of his or her life to get there. That is not a concern that I as an employer would have um, in terms of this. So if it's a religious accommodation, my answer would be if you can't do it because it's not working in your business then I wouldn't do it. I don't think you have to accommodate the religion. Um, disability uses, as I said, the same words, but a, you have to do a lot more. When, I, when I'll teach in class, I would say somebody who has facial hair because of their religion, somebody has facial hair because they have a skin disease that prevents them from shaving. You don't have to allow the facial hair under religion. You would have to allow the facial hair under ADA. It's just a, a quirk in the law that's been going on since, well, since the 70s with religion and since the ADA was passed, 92 went into effect in 94. So um, with that, what are my concerns with disability? Um, somebody first has to show that they have a disability and that their disability interferes, substantially limits one or more major life activities. So somebody who just says, I'm afraid, that's not a disability. Um, they would have to show that it interferes with, life, with major life activities. If they had a disability that prevented them from getting the vaccine, you would need to accommodate, but the accommodate has to be reasonable and not an undue hardship. Now, I would argue that it, is, that it is not reasonable for me to accommodate somebody who won't get the vaccine because of all of the things that I would have to do. But I have another argument. In order to be qualified when you're disabled, you need to be able to perform the essential functions of the job. I would argue that one of the essential functions of the job of the server at the restaurant is welcoming guests and having the guests not afraid that this person is not vaccinated. Um, the same thing with the person at the retail store, the same thing at the person at the auto mechanic that's talking to you that you're handing your credit card to. So anyone who's facing somebody, I would argue, it is part of the essential function of the job. And then I would argue that it's not reasonable for me to accommodate them because it would be an undue hardship because look of all that I have to do. The problem with this is that it's new, like everything else, and we don't have law on it. But my gut tells me, and I have spoke, I've been on some webinars, um, as um, Al said when he introduced me, I'm, I'm the director of Tyler, which is the Cornell Center for Innovative Hospitality, Labor and Employment Relations. We have 15 private practice law firms on our board, we've had these discussions and the consensus is, is that religion is going to be near impossible for employers to uh, employees to argue. Disability 
will be will have many hurdles and that employers can say if you want to work on site and i'm requiring you to work on site i need you to get the vaccine absent a specific law against it i would advise employers that wish to do so to require it thank you very much dave um we, we, we got one, one pre-submitted question. Uh, it says, um, are unvaccinated workers a protected class in terms of EEOC? Um, the answer is no. Um, the protected classes are Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, race, color, sex, religion, national origin, age, over 40. If you're 35, and I don't trust anybody over 30, you're not protected at 35. You're only protected until you hit 40. And disability, when you have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. We don't have general protections. And I think that's one of, um, it's the reason I have a job, I guess. But one of the reasons, one of the um, misnomers that most citizens have is they think they have more protections at work. They think the Constitution applies to their employers. So they'll say, it's my right. I have freedom of speech. You don't have freedom of speech from your employer. You have freedom of speech from your government. So if you stand up and say, my employer's product is horrible, the employer says, well, you can't go to jail, but you're fired. Um, and people who don't get a vaccine, there's no protection until Congress um, passes a law protecting them, which, you know, Congress hasn't passed a law, you know, Congress doesn't really pass laws. So um, that's really not something I'm concerned about. So no, they're not a protected class. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if this question was uh, more about uh, people that can't get vaccinated versus the one that won't, because we have two additional questions, which I think are uh, revolving around liability. So the employer demands vaccine, and then who is liable if something happens? You know, there are side effects and stuff. So, um, can employer be liable for anything that happens because of vaccination because they demand it? Well, let let's take a step back for the first question you asked, which is sort of what you know. So you, you're firing me because I and I want to get the vaccine and I can't. Um, and that was much a much bigger issue three months ago, four months ago, when there were towns where you, I mean, there, there weren't vaccines available. That could be what we call adverse impact, unintentional discrimination. So you have a policy or practice that's neutral on its face. Everybody has to get a vaccine, but it turns out that some protected class, be it race, color, sex, religion, something, they're living in a community where they have no access to it. And you would say, hey, hey look, you know, it's this whole group that is a protected class can't get the vaccine. I don't think that that's as relevant anymore that it seems at least where we are in New York, I'm watching TV commercials all the time saying, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, they're at every drugstore. So I'm not sure that they're, that it's not available, but that would be a concern if it's not available. If the reason you can't get it is because you, because it'll harm you as far as you know that now you're back to the ADA. And that's the, and that's the analysis we went through, reasonable accommodation that's not an undue hardship. With regard to liability, um, again, we're, we're, playing in, we're playing in some level of ignorance because we don't know what's going on and there haven't been court cases, but I would conclude that if my, if I, as an employer, required you to get a vaccine and you had an adverse reaction to it, that that would be a workers' comp um, type of injury. And the thing about workers' comp, workers' comp is a century old plus um, concept that we have in, the, in this country. It's funky because every state has its own workers' comp law. Um, for the Cornell folks around here, um, Bob Smith over at the ILR school made a career out of studying workers' comp laws because you had 50 of them. So you could always look at all kinds of things. So they are different from place to place. But what they are in general is this. It is a deal between the government, the employer, and the employee that there is no fault 
on, e on any party. If it's arising out of and in the course of employment and it results in an injury, you're eligible for workers' comp. And workers comp, there's no punitive damages. You get your medical paid, you'll get lost wages. If you're permanently disabled, you get a permanent partial disability or permanent total disability payout, but it's not what you would get in a tort case. And every employer in every state I know is required to have workers comp insurance. So it'll be covered by your workers comp insurance and, um, and it'll be an interesting question what workers' comp insurance companies do. I would rather, as you know, I'm a lawyer and far from a scientist, but if it was running, if I were workers' comp in, insurer, I would be more concerned about non-vaccinated people getting sick, giving the vaccine to other people, and those types of injuries than a vac than somebody getting sick from the vaccine. Those are the things that the insurance company is going to weigh out when they try to encourage you one way or the other, maybe with a rate benefit or detriment. But I think that most workers' comp insurance companies would probably prefer everyone being vaccinated. And if you, if somebody has an adverse reaction, you'll have insurance to cover it. Thank you. Yeah, and actually that, that was uh, the other aspect and the other question of uh, for unvaccinated individuals, are there any legal or job uh, uh, repercussions they may face? If, I guess if they are, you know, causing an outbreak, causing people to get sick, uh, potentially die. You, you know, that's that's gonna that's gonna be an interesting thing. That's sort of a that's a different one. That's you know, if if we go back, um, you know, several decades, we had some of that with with the AIDS virus. You know, is it? Um, somebody who had, um, who gave, who had unprotected sex and gave somebody AIDS, could you sue them for, um, the injury? And I think there was law out there that said, yes, you know, if it was, if you knew and tent, you intentionally did, you know, um, didn't have protection and so on. I think there were cases going there. So I think that probably some plaintiff's lawyer somewhere, some personal injury lawyer will sue somebody that you know got somebody sick because they you know they weren't vaccinated but it's not something that as an employer i would be overly concerned about um that's going to be in the tort world it's going to be common law stuff it's not going to really affect the employer um i don't think you're going to see an employer considered negligent for either side of the spectrum requiring it or not requiring it so I, I just don't see that right now as a major concern. Thank you. Does anybody else has anything to add? Maybe Melanie, if you have any comments on it. Sure, I mean, I'm definitely tracking with everything Dave's saying and in, in indefinite alignment. I think, you know, some of these unknowns because these are cases of first impression it is very likely why some companies haven't maybe gone so far as to just outright mandate vaccines. Uh, we've seen some companies mandate vaccines if you are going to be on site uh, and, and if you are not vaccinated, you will work remotely. Well, I think we can all know what the natural progression of that will end up being, which is over time, those remote employees may be deemed less productive, perhaps, um, <laughs> and the resulting consequences can can ensue. Um, we've seen, you know, we've seen a few companies go so far as to, you know, as to outright mandate the the vaccines. We haven't, I haven't seen any litigation come at least to public light uh, as of yet. But the, the majority seem to be incentivizing and encouraging the vaccines through um, time off, through four to six to eight hours of paid time, Dave, kind of going back to your point of, particularly for those who are not making a real high wage and, and, and were a little fearful of losing four hours of pay, um, their employer is offsetting that uh, as well. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, I think that, you know, can employers mandate? Absolutely. This has stood since a landmark case in 1905 when, when the smallpox outbreak occurred in Jacobson v. Massachusetts. It was upheld in the 20s when um, 
schools started to require proof of vaccination of children of certain vaccines as well. So I think it would be a, a heck of an uphill battle to overturn something that's been precedent since 1905 um, in the requirement of this. I think what's going to be unique and different is the variability of the application of tort law um, on a case-by-case -case basis with respect to alleged injuries resulting from um, those who have been, you know, for lack of a better phrase, you know, allowed to go unvaccinated. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a there's a couple things, and thank you. Um, I, I think you know clarified several points. I think a couple things is with regard and with regard to the general concept. Yes, employers can require vaccines, and again, as can schools and so on. Um, but um, I think the, the point is we haven't seen much because the way the discrimination law works in this country is that you don't feel believe you were discriminated against and go right into court. You have to go through either the federal agency, the EEOC, or a state agency. In New York, we have the New York Division of Human Rights. In Illinois, it's the Illinois Department of Human Rights. They're all pretty much the same. Um, and you have to go through either one of those, and that takes time. Um, after six months, you can request a letter that will allow you to sue um, if you have counsel and you're ready to go forward with that. Um, if you go through the process, it could take a year for them to assign an investigator. So we're in, a, we're in a lag time in terms of why we haven't seen lots of litigation yet. Um, but again, it's one of those things where um, the law is on the side of the employer and it's a huge uphill battle for either the agency or the plaintiff's um, lawyer. And the plaintiff's lawyer is going to have to invest years and years of time in a case of first impression. It's not a good business move. And so it's why employers really don't have the huge risk. Now, the thing is, and I think it's a good point, is to, is to look and say, well, why aren't all employers doing this? And the answer is that the law is not always, the, you know, the law is your floor, not your ceiling. And there's HR components to it. There are, um, there's in many industries, there's a labor shortage right now. And so firing a whole bunch of people because they won't get the vaccine and then not being able to open your business is not a great business move. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's a whole political aspect of this, of this vaccine. And now you're talking about getting um, maybe some customer or guest backlash, or you're getting employee um, morale issues. And now you might have, and now that might lead to unionization. So there's all these practical reasons that many of the employers that are on my board, they're strongly encouraging. Um, as said, they're giving paid time. They're doing other things to encourage the people. They're educating because they're trying not to be heavy handed because they don't want the non-legal repercussions um, of what they're doing. They're trying to get there in more of a holistic than a sort of order um, format. But you know, if we look at this is important to me and I wanna do it, can I? I would say yes. Um, should you, that's really dependent on your workforce, your where you're located and all and all of those other factors for your business. Um, I really shouldn't comment because I, just a lawyer here from a societal standpoint, I wish employers would do it. We need to get there. We need a higher percentage of people vaccinated. And if our employers would all do that, that would probably be a hell of a lot better than the commercials on TV telling us to get vaccines. Um, so I wish that employers would do it. I think society will be better off, but employers aren't in the business of always doing what's best for society. They have to run their own business and avoid bankruptcy, um, and they need people to work. So they're weighing out what's best for themselves. Dave, maybe a follow-up to that. Let's assume you are the CEO of a small upstate New York dairy company, not 150 employees. There are a bunch of dairy companies in the same area. You have the competition for employees, but they listen to you and they're taking the societal responsibility. We're going to require vaccination. Nuts and bolts. 
practically, what would you be doing? Is it just an email to everyone? Is there something more legalese that you're gonna put out to minimize your risks? What else would you would you do? And then maybe others to chime in same along the same lines. Because I think some of the people we have online today, either either, you know, are part of companies like this, maybe smaller, maybe larger, or will be asked by companies like this for advice. And I think that's sort of probably on people's mind. I think it's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think that there are two issues with the communication. One is um, one is legal and one is um, practical and, and morale wise. On the legal standpoint, the ADA requires that you engage in an interactive process. So when somebody says, I have a disability, whatever their, dis I mean, I'm dyslexic, I'm whatever their disability is, um, I have a bad back you need to engage. What, what, it, well, what do you need? Well, I need to ice my back every hour. So I need a freezer in my office or access to a freezer for my ice pack. Okay, that's what you need. So you have to engage with that. So if you put out an edict that says you must get the vaccine and if you don't get it by a week from Tuesday, um, um, you know, we're gonna um, fire you, then that could be an ADA problem. So in my communication, I would put in if something prevents you from getting the, the vaccine, please inform. And I wouldn't have it to your supervisor because I think that's a problem. I would have my vaccine czar, you know, that it all goes to that person so that they can manage it. So that's, that's the legal. From the more practical HR standpoint is, you know, and, and the way you described it is, I've got competition that my, my employees can go across the street or down the block or to the next town. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna educate them. I wanna educate them that this is better for you. It is better for society. It's you know, the, the stuff that we're, that, that we're seeing on TV and the stuff that we're seeing all over the place. You know, I would do that. I think it's just a, a people move so that it shows that you care, that you're not being draconian that this is the right thing for all. And if people don't like it, they quit and so on, at least you gave them information and did the right communication. So that would be my way of doing it. There was, uh, Dave, there was a question, um, you know, should we mandate or incentivize vaccination? At first, it sounded like you were more for a mandate, but now I feel like it's kind of a mix of, of mandate and incentivizing uh, vaccination. I, I guess, you know, it, it's easy for me because I don't run a business and I don't have, you know, so I, you know, I want them to mandate because I'm looking at the numbers and I want us to be at 90%, not at, you know, nation, nationwide 50 and the fact that the July 4th goal is likely not gonna be met because people aren't getting the vaccine is causing me a lot of stress. So I want it and I think employers should do it. But at the end of the day, employers have many things that they're looking at. Um, I would think that certain employers should use it as a competitive advantage. Um, those that really are guests or customer facing would be putting up a sign. Everyone here is vaccinated. I think that that would be good for business. I would prefer to go to a restaurant where everyone's vaccinated as opposed to, I just don't know. So I think that you can use it as a business tool, but I think it would be way too arrogant of me to tell employers who I don't know their specific circumstances. I don't know what their workforce is, where they line up um, politically, religion wise and so on for you to say, you should do this, damn it, when I don't know. But deep down, I hope that employers would, and I would say legally you can. And Al, this is, this is Melanie. I mean, I echo, Dave, what you're saying. And I think at some point too, perhaps, and this may sound a little aspirational, sometimes competition needs to turn into a consortium. And I realize that, you know, in your scenario, there's multiple different, you know, competitors of about the same size competing for the same employee market. Uh, but maybe in times like this, when there is such a distinct direct threat to the public and the community, joining forces and creating maybe that joint educational approach so that, that 
all the companies in the area are educating folks on the benefit and the efficacy uh, and the safety of these vaccines. And so that they're not employer shopping just simply based upon the vaccine related requirements of the employers, if that makes any sense. I mean, we've seen similar types of approaches with you know, the, the salmonella in raw poultry and, and, and big poultry companies who every other day of the week are definitely competing against each other and not sharing a heck of a lot. But when it comes to that common good and that common industry good, maybe we need to start talking to each other more and, and creating some broader industry-based approaches to solving this problem of not seeing the numbers where we want them. I think it's a, I think it's a great point, and I think in some ways it's happening in certain areas like Chamber of Commerce and different trade organizations are are doing that and and working with the employers. Um, so, but but I agree. I think that it is a it is a time for employers to um, look at they they have the ability to promote social good and social health by doing this, and they really have more power than anyone else. Uh, if government isn't gonna mandate the vaccine. And so it's really schools and employers that are forcing or, or incentivizing people who are reluctant. So I think it's a great point and a great idea. And, and on top of the chamber and, you know, in, I'm obviously from the hotel school, you know, we have the American Hotel Lodging Association, the Natural, National Restaurant Association, International um, Franchising Association. I would think all of those groups should be out there with their members saying, let's do this together and get us to the numbers we need to be at. So I think it's a great point. So Dave, maybe, maybe you have the answer. If you look at the whole US workforce right now, across all industry, what percent is in a job where vaccination is mandated? I think it's very low. Um, I don't have it, but I think it's very low. And, and this is basically anecdotal, but I've run several roundtables and webinars with, with private practice lawyers who represents hundreds of clients. So, you know, you've got a roundtable of 12 lawyers and they have, you know, hundred clients each. It's, you know, it's not a insignificant number and very few of them are demanding, but they're strongly encouraging but again, it's, it's in the hospitality industry and they're finding that their numbers are really high because what happened was you had an industry that got decimated and you've got an industry that deals with all kinds of people every day. And people were, you know, it's, it's like healthcare. There are some healthcare folks. I know that there was a hospital in Houston that fired some people um, for, you know, because they mandated it, but it was a very small um, percentage of employees who didn't get the vaccine that had to be um, terminated from their employment. And I think we're seeing similar things in hospitality. So most of the hospitality companies are getting there without the mandate. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, very different in manufacturing where you're not, you're not dealing with guests, customers and so on. But look, where were the biggest workplace outbreaks? It was, it was in meat processing plants where people are standing next to each other all day long. So I think it's a small number, but um, you know, again, I hope it grows. Um, I, I would like to move uh, to other topics that, uh, that um, the questions that came in uh, before uh, the office hours. Uh, 